I didn't know when I went to the Netherlands if I would do a book or what it, what it would be. I just knew I wanted to see more. You can kind of see the trip log there. So it was just under a month we were there and we had no real plan. So yeah, it was just, we kind of made it up as we went along, but we saw like a few of the, I guess, showpiece yeah. infrastructure, I guess, things <laughs> for want of a better word, like the, the Hovenring, the bridge over the school in Utrecht. But really it was just have no plan, go where we want to, like to the cities we want to go to and whatever we see, we see. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Simmerman and that is Roy Simons, uh, author of the book Feedspot and a couple other cool books that we are going to be talking about here today. Uh, he resides up in British Columbia, up in Canada, but he's originally from Scotland. Uh, this is a fascinating discussion, so let's get right to it with Roy. Roy, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Hey, you're welcome, John. Thanks for having me. Hey, Roy, I love having my guests just uh, say a few words about themselves. So who the heck is Roy Simons? <laughs> yeah, so I guess if we want to go all the way back to the start, I born in Scotland, lived there for about 30 years and then moved to Canada. I don't have too many pictures of my hometown, but live just yeah. south of Edinburgh, about 10 miles south of Edinburgh. So this is the Pentland Hills, nice. located pretty much between Pennycook and Edinburgh. Um, so this is where I guess my interest in biking came from, either the woods behind the house or um, getting out <laughs> into the hills here. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and I studied civil and transportation engineering at school, um, worked for engineering firms, basically since graduation, as I still do today. So that's kind of it. Moved to Canada in 2008. Um, okay. Yeah, I've been here ever since. And what brought you to Canada? So, so pretty much the mountain biking. Again, I used to mountain bike back home in the hills you see there. I would watch videos from the North Shore, from Whistler. Really wanted to do that. Came over for a holiday um, to snowboard, actually. And yeah, just loved it. At the time, I worked for one of the bigger engineering firms who had offices here as well as in Edinburgh. And yeah, the transfer was pretty smooth. Um, they needed somebody that did what I did. And yeah, kind of the rest is history. Wow. And, uh, and why don't you uh, explain a little bit more in detail, like where you're located now? Yeah, so maybe if you jump back a slide there to the kind of gravel bike picture there. Um, I've taken a a lot of pictures from that spot there. So I live up on Burnaby Mountain, um, ah, so just okay. east of Vancouver. So in the distance there, you can barely make out this kind of skyscrapers, but that's downtown Vancouver, North Shore Mountains to the to the right of the screen there. Um, and this is Burnaby Mountain Park. Um, so I lived here for the first five years when I came to Vancouver and then moved around a little bit in the lower mainland. And then I've been back here for about five years now. It's it's just like a really nice little community. I have bike trails on my doorstep. Essentially, there just used to be the university up on top of the mountain, Simon Fraser University. And I think since about 2001, I want to say, they started building like a community up here. Um, so there's a lot of, I'd say kind of mid-rise condos, um, some townhomes now. And now we have like grocery store, liquor store, kind of coffee shops fast food places and whatnot. Um, so it's it's really grown from when I first moved here into like a really nice little complete community. Albeit my commute to work, um, which is in Burnaby as well, is 300 meters downhill on the way there and about 300 meters of climbing on the way home. So Right, right. Yeah. Well, you gotta, you gotta stay in shape, you know? <laughs> exactly, it's good for that. I could go, I could go into so many details about like the pros and cons of owning e-bikes and and whatnot here because it used to be like my main form of fitness and then i'd mountain bike at the weekend as you see here that's about as good as i ever got before i <laughs> spend most of my weekends riding around the city taking pictures but right yeah i did find when i got the e-bike first like i was using it all the time on turbo mode and yeah i really felt like i lost a lot of fitness there because i was no longer kind of stressing my legs through the week so i always kind of laugh at those th arguments, which are true to a certain extent, that, you know, e-bikes make you fitter. Like, it depends on the baseline, right? <laughs> so I still use the e-bike now, but usually it's for days where, like, my legs are tired from doing something else. And 
yeah, try and, try and still ride up the hill on the regular bike um, as often as I can, just to, like you say, keep me in shape. Yeah, I, I, I try to uh, reserve the e-bike. Uh, mine's a cargo bike, uh, the Turn GSD. So it's a it's a big, huge load of a bike. And so I try to really reserve it for when I know I, am, I need it for the cargo carrying capacity. And I do live up on a, uh, on, a, on a plateau, on a hill. And so I've got a steep climb that I do have to get up. And so having that ability to, to kick that into turbo mode and let that, you know, that Bosch uh, uh, cargo motor kick in and, and, and get me up that is really, really helpful. But uh, yeah, I, I try to get out on my analog bike whenever I can, to, especially like when I'm going to the park and going to the trailhead to go for a trail run. Uh, you know, I, I need that fitness. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 58 going on 59 years old. And it's like, yeah, I, 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 I can't get too lazy on this. So uh, I certainly do lean into and use the electric assist uh, for what it's meant to be used for. But uh, uh, it is humans being what we are. We need to make sure that we uh, don't always take the easy way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. exactly. It's good to have options. And even this, like we went from two cars down to one and that was about the same time we got the e-bike. So it's almost like a car replacement. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or it gives you the option to not have to pedal if you don't really want to. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's interesting too is, you know, going back to this photo of you uh, getting, catching some air out in the mountain biking is that we have a similar story in terms of, I, I suspect that, you know, you have that, that recreation and sports cycling uh, sort of orientation. And that really helped draw you to the British Columbia area with the extraordinary mountain biking that was there. You did mention that you were there primarily for snowboarding or sneak skiing in the beginning, but it seems like then it wasn't too long that, you know, especially given the work that you're doing and now what you're focusing on, because you sort of alluded to it, you're spending a lot of time taking photos out in the urban environment. And then that brings us to some of your influences here in terms of uh, some very familiar books. I'm pretty sure I've got every one of these uh, <laughs> in my library over here. So talk a little bit about this part of your story, because I think this is fundamental to your story. And for the listening only audience, this is a stack of books, uh, you know, starting at the top with uh, smart, the smart growth manual, um, down through tactical urbanism, walkable city from Jess Speck, happy city from Charles Montgomery, right up there in the in BC area. And then of course, uh, our friends, the, the Bruntlets with curbing traffic and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, talk a little bit about these influences. Yeah, so it's, it is quite interesting, actually, because like you say, like, there's pictures of me riding in Whistler and things there. Some people might call that extreme or whatever, but it was, it was fun, right? And yeah. when I moved to Canada, living in Burnaby, working in Burnaby, I wanted to start biking to work. Like it, it, living back in Scotland, it wasn't really set up for that. We were about 10 miles south, but it was like rural country roads, fast moving traffic. There's no way to really I was going to cycle. I think I did it once. So yeah, so getting to Burnaby, got a commuter bike, started biking to work. That was about 2008. So I'm trying to think. The first downtown bike lane in Vancouver, or protected bike lane, I think was 2010. So obviously some people had started thinking about these things, but it wasn't top of my mind. And even working like in the transportation industry, we talked about accommodating bikes like back in the work I was doing in Scotland, the stuff I was doing initially in Canada was, I'd call it a very transportation planning workload, all sorts of things, even including traffic modeling for some, for some projects. And I was biking to work. I was biking, you might not know the streets here, but down Gallardy Way, which is down the hill from Burnaby Mountain and along Lougheed Highway, which is kind of 70 kilometer an hour arterial roadway which is horrible to cycle along and that was just the most direct way for me i did it i didn't enjoy it maybe too much but i didn't really think that it could be something better right and then i would say so that was like 2008 there was a lot of changes going on at work at that time a lot of changeover in staff and i was kind of getting a little jaded with it needed some inspiration um as you said there and yeah, I started, I think on lunchtime, like I was literally looking through, I want to say the iBook store on my phone, but I'm not even sure if that existed then, but it, I was looking through something on my phone, looking for like planning books for some inspiration. Um, and the first one was Walkable City by Jeff Speck. 
Ah, cool, cool. And so I started reading this, and literally, it was blowing my mind. Like I, <laughs> you know, I'd done four years at university. I'd been working at that point for twelve years after graduating, and there was things, you know, like induced demand. I'd been doing some traffic modeling work. I'd never heard of that, which. It just blows my mind. Like, how could I not have been taught that? And when you look, I guess, back like the famous quotes from, I think, is it Lewis Mumford or something about loosening your belt to solve congestion? I'm like, how was that never in my kind of university um, curriculum or whatever? So that was, that book, I think, fund- fundamentally changed my the course of my career. Like, I was, after I read that, I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> like, we can do a lot better here. And by that time, Vancouver had started doing some protected bike lanes. I think Hornby was 2010. Burrard Bridge was maybe about that time. So everything was kind of, I was started reading that book. Vancouver was doing things. After that book, of course, I bought some more. And yeah, I just felt kind of really inspired to kind of do that kind of work. Um, I love biking anyway, so it kind of made sense in some in some respects to do it as a job sometimes you know that's not always the best idea but um it's worked out pretty well so yeah about that was probably 2012 i was reading that book 2013 the job at isl came came up um who i'm still with now um, my role's changed since since the start but yeah that kind of gave me a new lease of life like i was at that point the manager of transportation planning um so i had a bit more freedom to choose what we went after um, and really give me a chance to kind of, yeah, basically go in the direction I wanted to go in. And about, I don't think I have any pictures for it, but about that time, again, I was forming these thoughts in my head. I was trying to kind of, that was one of the things when I started reading the book, I was like, I'm just kind of going around, going about my business like I was taught at school. I'm not really thinking about it. I wasn't applying the critical thinking that, I felt was really needed and reading those books, like it was forming thoughts. And I think like even Jeff Speck would admit at the time, his book wasn't the most progressive in terms of biking infrastructure and the things he was talking about. And in fact, Jeff and I had that conversation. (laughs) So (laughs) I I had him on the podcast, uh, you know, to, to basically talk about uh, the new version. Uh, So the 10 year anniversary uh, book of walkable city has a hundred additional pages Mm -hmm. tacked on to the original book. And so he took those hundred pages to reflect on some of the things that, you know, held true and were proven in, in the, in the first version of the book, a walkable city. Uh, but then he has an entire chapter, uh, talking about how, oh yeah, he, he learned so much in that decade about, uh, kind of what he got wrong with how powerful bikes are, uh, in, especially in empowering mobility, uh, within communities. So, yeah. Yeah. So that was, I guess I was trying to form those thoughts in my head. So I started um, my own kind of blog slash website and that would have been 2014, I think. And yeah, I was just putting all these ideas out. It kind of forced me to, you know, make sure I was kind of, I had sound thoughts. Um, So it's not this, it it used to be called transportationplanning.com. And I was like, I'm just going to talk about all the things that I do as a transportation planner. And then it wasn't until later when I started doing the books that I kind of changed it to rolling in the city because really everything I was doing was focusing focusing on bikes and rolling, essentially. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, let, let's just pause just a second on this so, since I've got your website up. So this is your new blog. Uh, and again, it's called Rolling in the City. And so uh, you you. you oftentimes we'll have blog posts. And so your most recent blog post was diving into uh, Victoria, which is one of the the, the most uh, bicycle friendly communities in North America, uh, and they've been doing some wonderful things. You know, obviously we just had an episode with Todd Littman, and so we talked a little bit about Victoria and and some of the work that he's been doing over the past uh, three to four decades uh, there in Victoria. But uh, yes, so continue. This was uh, written uh, in December twenty eighth is when you published this particular blog post. Yeah, and a lot of those projects actually are ISL projects. Um, I'm less involved in the island work these days, but still I'm to a certain extent, but ISL have kind of 
designed or designed in partnership with other firms and certainly saw through all the construction for probably the last five years, all their protected bike lane projects. Yeah, so it's I always love going over there and kind of riding around and it's it's been wonderful to see it, you know, obviously, you know, uh, sort of evolve, I'm, I'm sure, over the years. Um, I'm, I'm sort of following it from from a distance. I was there, I think in what year was I there? I must have been there in 2017. I was in Vancouver. So just at the start then. Yeah. Yeah. In, in Vancouver, I was there in 2016 for the the walk bike places conference okay. which yeah. was there so i was there for that i was actually and, there uh, at that yeah yeah i was gonna say you would have been there for that i'm sure and of course uh chris and melissa bruntlett were still living in vancouver at that time so i, I connected with them at that time but yeah it, it's got to be really you know quite satisfying and and i did have dale bracewell on on the podcast as well so i've interviewed him about just before he left the city of vancouver in and so I had him on to talk a little, reflect a little bit about the development of uh, the active mobility and the protected bike lanes in uh, in the Vancouver area. Uh, so that was really kind of cool. But you got to be pinching yourself after these, you know, the all these years of like seeing this happening right around you at the same time. You're like really going full, you know, just diving in the deep end and, and being passionate about this kind of stuff. Yeah, no, it's been it's been an amazing ride the last I would say ten years. Yeah, yeah, I should probably actually like again going back to twenty fourteen when I started the first blog. That was about the same time I got on Twitter, which I kind of did reluctantly. Um, but one of the guys in our firm was pushing me, um, saying if he ever watches this, <laughs> um, and that was probably the best, second best to the books learning experience. Um, just seeing all the good and bad practice, I guess, shared around the world, like was amazing for kind of learning really quickly what what works and what doesn't work. And it's a bit of a sadder state of affairs on Twitter these days, but (laughs) there's still some value there. Um, I know. Yeah. And, and I'll I'll pull it up here as, as well. um, Because I know what you mean. I, I'm, I feel the same way. It's, it's been, pretty amazing, um, you know, kind of over the years and it's a little less amazing at this point in time. Uh, but yeah, so Roy, the planner is, is who you are out on, uh, Twitter slash X in our current world. And, and, and yeah, you're not anywhere near as, as, uh, active as you used to be. Um, I can tell, uh, I have to spend way too much time out in social media just because I'm constantly producing content and sharing content and amplifying other people's content. And so, yes. So yeah, yeah. So Twitter was part you, of your story. Yeah. Yeah. I certainly <laughs> appreciate you sharing that because it is, even as somebody that's no, you know, written a few books, it, yeah, it kills me to kind of try and promote them on there and you get yeah. like five likes and 30 people <laughs> exactly. see it maybe. <laughs> um, exactly. So. Yeah. You have to develop tough skin. I mean, I just keep broadcasting it out there and I, I get reminded occasionally uh, out in the real world, you know, I'll, I'll run into somebody and, uh, and, and they'll be like, Oh man, I really appreciate the, your constant flow of information on, you know, Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, you know, whatever it is. And I'm like, Oh, well, I had no idea. Cause you never interact. So there's a lot of people who are just sort of very, very passive and voyeuristic on that. So that's a good thing to remember too, is that yeah. you're broadcasting a message out and you never have no idea who actually sees it. Yeah. And I'm guilty of that as well. Like I, I used to, engage in conversations all the time and yeah it just got painful and <laughs> well and um, pl- plus if you if you engaged in every single you know thing that you saw as you're scrolling by you know you're like scrolling past you know if you did that every single yeah. you know, image etc you'd never get any work done so yeah exactly yeah. yeah so yeah i guess while you're on that photo there um it's it's a good place to speak to the more recent things i've been doing um so yeah, the blog kind of carried on for a while. And then I think it was probably COVID time, um, you know, stuck in the house watching things on YouTube and whatever. For whatever reason, I came across street photography um, videos. People like just going around taking photos. You'd see them walking around like with a camera strapped to them or whatever. But they were taking really like artistic photos. And I'm like, I'd been taking photos for a long time before that. Again, I didn't send you anything. I have like a Flickr page that has... 
I think now it's about 5,000 photos sorted by by location, by infrastructure type. And I used to be really good at keeping that up to date. I'm not, not as good at that anymore. I tend to leave it in the blog. But I was always taking photos, but it was usually just, you know, riding or walking along the street, oh, there's something or somebody interesting, snap a photo, upload it to Flickr, it is what it is kind of thing. And then, so I started seeing those videos and I was, again, just bored during COVID, I guess. And I was like, oh, I used to have a good camera. Like I did like taking photos and things, but never really had a purpose. So I was like, what if I took this and applied it to, you know, like bike infrastructure or, you know, city building, whatever you want to call it. So yeah, I bought a new camera. I was initially just taking photos as I was, but trying to be a little bit more intentional with it. So whereas before I would, you know, just take photos of opportune moments as I was walking or riding along, like pulling my phone out of my pocket as I'm riding. Um, before it was like, okay, there's a nice protected intersection. So I'll, you know, I'll stand here for 10 minutes or 20 minutes and, you know, maybe somebody will come by on a cargo bike or something and I'll get a, like, a more visually interesting shot, if you like, to, to show off the benefits of, of a protected intersection. So I was doing that, just initially walking around, looking for interesting things, waiting around, taking photos if there was interesting people coming by. Um, so going back, sorry, to that photo of the, the coffee shop there. Um, if you would have read the, la the last blog post in Victoria, so that's where this is, a pretty cool story. I was over there for work in December, and the guy had reached out not long before that that owns the shop, um, Shane. And he's like, yeah, if you're in town, like, let's have a chat, like super into Dutch infrastructure, bike infrastructure. He goes there a lot as well. So, yeah, I met up with him and unknown to me at the time like that was his coffee shop um i go in there he has a copy of feats pad on the shelves that for customers to read and everything but his shop just interested me because there was like people riding by on bikes there was people sitting outside enjoying their coffee the sun was good i guess that's one of the biggest challenges i've had with the the photography side of it when i would watch those videos on youtube they're generally walking around the city say looking for good light and like opportunities for good photos which usually means good light whereas I don't have the luxury of that. I'm working, you know, 40 hour week here. So I'm in Victoria for the weekend. I'm going to still wait around for that 10 or 20 minutes for the cargo bike to come by, but I'm not going to wait for good light necessarily. Like those photos are in black and white on the recent blog post because the light was so bad and it was like foggy. <laughs> it looked better in black and white. Yeah. Um, well, this one came so, out quite well. I mean, the, the, yeah, so clear, that was, clearly, yeah. <laughs> I think back in 2020 when I first got like a good camera and yeah, the light was awesome that day. Um, well, good, on, good, good on you getting out there, you know, with a good camera. I, I have to admit that most of the still photography that I end up, you know, catching these days is I would say eight out of 10 times is my iPhone. I'm like, I'm pulling, like yeah. I'm like literally pulling it out because I see a scene about to happen and I'm like, boom, let's capture it. And, uh, and, and I'm just really blown away at the, the quality that, that they are able to, to, you know, capture now reminds me of like the quality a decade ago that I was able to get with my, you know, fancy camera. I'm yeah, just, it's interesting. Yeah. I guess I'm, I'm going to disagree with you there. <laughs> uh, well, I, you, you know, I know, it, you know, from a real, uh, from a real, real camera perspective, you can't compare, but just being able to, it's in my pocket anyways, being able to do it and capture it. That's, that's what I'm trying to say is just that ability to do it. So, there is yeah. like the phone does like I have whatever it is, an like iPhone 14 pro or something. Um, but it's still, it doesn't compare like some of the photos in, from the feats pad trip. So most of them are with a good camera. There were the odd ones taken from with my phone just sure, sure. because that's what was easiest at the time. And then when I got home, it was, <laughs> it was really frustrating, like the difference in quality. And maybe if somebody's got the book, they can look through it and figure out the couple of iPhone pictures that made it in there. Yeah. Um, well, and, but, and we, we, we've been talking about it, you know, quite a bit. So, you know, the, the Feats, Feats Pod book, book is right here. And uh, I, it looks like the, the photo behind you is probably the same image that go, we yeah. have on screen. <laughs> uh, we're going to dive into some of the images from this as we continue our conversation. But yeah, let's let's con let's continue this. Uh, the next the image is, again, of your 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 blog page and the website that you are posting your new content out. And then this one is is diving into the bike lanes book. So what 
really, I think I know the answer to this, but what was really the inspiration uh, for you to dive in and do this book? Yeah. So as I said, I was taking better photos and initially I think I was just putting them on the Flickr site and I was like, no, these are starting to, you know, I'm getting pretty good at this <laughs> still far away from pro photographer level, but you know, I feel like I could do something more with these and create something, I guess, more lasting than a Flickr page that probably not that many people use. Like I use it talking to clients and things like, Oh, have you seen how they did this here? How about we do something similar? But I wanted to do something more lasting. Never, I mean, I write reports and plans and things all the time, but never done a book. So I was kind of just trying to think what I could do with these photos. Like some of them were starting to tell a bit of a story. And, you know, yeah, so take this one, for example. We've got somebody riding by on the protected bike lane, somebody going into a store, but they're both looking at each other. And it's like, it's trying to say, you know, what could they be thinking about? You know, is the person going into the store looking at that person biking and thinking, oh, you know, that looks fun or easy. Like maybe, maybe I could do that. So trying to, again, get those messages across, which I would see on Twitter all the time, like, you know, these different perspectives. You know, some people look at it, nobody's ever going to ride. Or these bike lanes are... Nobody's writing these bike lanes. Oh, I can't even remember now, like all the different things I write on Twitter, but it's trying to say they're not just for the people writing right now. It's for the people that see these people writing and realize it's easy and it might inspire them to do it. So that's kind of, I actually went there because of the, the pickup window, which I thought was a really neat thing that a lot of restaurants should have. So you can come by and pick things up on your bike, but they weren't using that that day, but I happened to capture that picture. And which is a great picture. And I love the the title of this too. Protected bike lanes aren't even for cyclists because there's a neat little double entendre to that. Just like you're, you're saying is that, you know, these people who are walking into the store, they're noticing the person riding by. Who knows? Maybe they may even know it or recognize that person. Maybe that person's maybe, beaming yeah. and smiling, you know, or whatever. And it, it, to your point, yeah, it might encourage them. Hey, oh, yeah. Hey, next time we can just ride our bike here to this, you know, to this exactly, shop. Yeah. But the other double entendre to this, too, is it's it's not even for cyclists. Going back to the fact that we both made our way into this world of urban cycling, you know, from, you know, being sport and recreation, you know, cyclists, you know, quote unquote cyclists, you know, the, the, the lycra clad cyclists and sporty people. It's like, yeah, I mean, the, the protected bike lanes, we don't probably really even need protected bike lanes, but it's not for us anyways. It's, it's really for everyone, not just quote unquote cyclists. Yeah. So <laughs> a lot of as well, what I was trying to do with the book is like, we have a lot of technical guidance that says, you know, a protected bike lane should look like this, be this width, curb should be this high, maybe. So I was trying to, again, put that into pictures so that people could be like, oh, like Victoria did this, North Vancouver did that, Vancouver did this. Like, let's, you know, share that information beyond, obviously people are doing it on Twitter and social media. But again, this is another example. Just by chance, I was waiting there. There was lots of people going by. I just liked kind of the old guy, traditional cyclist if you like with a high vis and then the younger guy coming by like it's no problem on the scooter so yeah i think in north vancouver at least they call them mobility lanes um i think where most places are still looking for the perfect name for a bike lane now that captures everything but excludes cars <laughs> um so yeah again just another opportune moment that i could kind of use to tell the story a little bit yeah yeah and really this book is, again, it's, if you're in the industry, you, you kind of know everything pretty well. Like it's maybe not the book for you, but it is more for those that are maybe new to kind of urbanism or bike planning and design. It kind of just, you could read literally the table of contents and you'd be able to talk a pretty good game about, you know, protected bike lanes and, and infrastructure. Here's another, another nice one, yeah. Yeah, this one I included, I, I couldn't not include this. So this is in Nanaimo. We did their complete street standards and guideline, but the continuous sidewalks were the, I guess, the major innovation there. Um, yeah, Huge. this is beautiful. Yeah, 
This is great. Yeah, and and, and you, you 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 said for the listening audience, we're looking at a. Um, uh, a, a photo now on screen where we have a, a continuous elevation of the sidewalk and a continuous elevation of the separated uh, bicycle path. And so very, very, you know, similar to what we would see over in the Netherlands. And so, yeah, this is a fantastic design for North America. Yeah. So that kind of inspiration came from like a week long trip in Amsterdam back in 2015. And that was kind of the if anything, the one thing that I wanted to do from that trip. Um, and this project, I think, started in late 2018, 2019. This was built probably a few years ago now. So it's like a two, three kilometer long corridor with you know multiple continuous sidewalks there. But essentially, the city adopted that as the standard for their kind of local street collector street intersections. Um, so anything new that gets built there will be to that standard. And that kind of... At the time, I guess I was still promoting that. I mean, I still do to an extent, but promoting that on social media, um, I got a huge positive response and Nanaimo won a lot of awards for it, um, which was really pleasing to see. But it was kind of, that kind of spurred the later trips because I was like, like, this was amazing. Like, but what else can we do? I felt like I'd only really scratched the surface with the Netherlands. And then that's why I'm trying to think 2022, we, we did the Feats Pad trip. And really that... Yeah, that was the driver to kind of dive deeper into the Dutch bike network and infrastructure, kind of get into the nuances of it a lot more than I did on that that one week trip back in 2015. So the the last slide that we have from that first book here is, is of course, you know, hey, we need to be building these lanes. We've got protected bike lanes now, but we need to be building them so that people can safely pass. And the other thing that, that I think of when I see this photo, too, is, is something that uh, um, uh, Chris Bruntlett with the Dutch Cycling Embassy oftentimes uh, emphasizes is that cycling, you know, riding a bike, people riding bikes, it should be a social activity. You should be able to have your facilities be wide enough that people can be you know, riding side by side. You should. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to promise we can do that all the time because... You know, in this case, so this again is one of our projects and we were fortunate we could remove a lane of parking um, and that really made the space available for the wide protected bike lane. You can see the, the old painted bike lane, um, just kind of the where it's been um, eradicated there, which is like half the width of that new lane. So again, it was just trying to use the photos to convey like a, a pretty important planning principle um, or design principle more than you would see and a guideline that says, you know, a bike lane should be 1.8 to 2.5 meters wide. It's like, well, okay, what does that look like? And I think, I forget, but these are maybe 2.5, so they're at the upper end. Um, but these guys are cycling comfortably side by side here. And yeah, I wish we could achieve that on all our projects. It's not always possible. Um, we definitely have some that go to the, the minimums, which I think there's debates there, you know, is... Is a narrower protected bike lane still better than no protected bike lane? Not everybody might agree, but right. wherever we can, we should be building them wide for people to pass. So then the next book comes along, and this is when you dive into the concept of neighborhood bikeways. And we're, we'll, we'll go through these uh, series of photos relatively quickly. I'll just kind of scroll through these and let you just sort of uh, riff off of them because I, I want to spend as much time as possible on your final book, which, of course, uh, we, we already uh, teased out the Feetspod book. Yeah. So, again, this was just I was collecting more pictures. We were doing more neighborhood bikeway projects um, in the company. And it was just really, again, trying to convey planning and design principles um, for that specific infrastructure type because really beyond Vancouver and Victoria there there weren't a lot of neighborhood bikeways um, they go by a lot of names I guess I feel like after the Feetspad book this probably needs an update to include bicycle streets and some more progressive design ideas we have a couple of projects we're going to work on that might have some of those elements I can't say too much there at the moment but I'm hoping in the next couple of years there will be some some good photos of something that's close to a Dutch bicycle street. So getting away from the shallow pavement markings, looking more at the kind of uh, the, the feet strap markings um, from the Netherlands, adding continuous sidewalks like you see here um, to stop people kind of blowing through the stops, that kind of thing. Yeah, so that was book number two. And 
yeah, again, just spending my summers riding around, taking pictures, trying to, again, visualize the challenges like here, like close passing um, where the road isn't too wide and it has parking, getting people across busy streets, all the things that should naturally happen along a, a dedicated bike route, but sometimes don't, right? So, yeah, that was book two, and then it was kind of felt it was time to explore the Netherlands in, in a lot more detail than I had previously. Yeah. And that brings us up to your most recent book, uh, again, Feats Pod. And uh, talk, talk a little bit about, um, uh, I think we know what the inspiration was because you just mentioned it, but uh, talk a little bit about doing this. I mean, this is, this is a massive book. This is 400 pages. And uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, your, how you published it and, and a little bit of that. And then we'll dive into the actual book itself. Yeah, that's probably interesting for a lot of people as well. So I didn't use a traditional book publisher. I, the complexity of trying to go that route just didn't appeal to me. I enjoy the process of putting it together, editing, editing it myself. So I don't know how I came across Blurb, um, but they are essentially a self-publishing company. Um, so you can upload any PDF essentially, and they'll make it into a book. But the advantage of Blurb is that they also have a bookstore, so you can sell it. So yeah, it was a bit of a shot in the dark. Like I thought when I did bike lanes, I'm like, yeah, I think this is pretty good in my eyes. And of course you have so much self-doubt. I go back and look at it, you know, 10 times every day. Like, yeah, I think people would pay for this maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I obviously started with bike lanes and except bicycles. And I didn't know when I went to the Netherlands if I would do a book or what it, what it would be. I just knew I wanted to see more. You can kind of see the trip log there. So it was just under a month we were there and we had no real plan. We landed in, or landed in Amsterdam, got the train to Utrecht. And yeah, I think we had a couple of days booked there, but then we kind of did everything on the fly. We kind of knew roughly, like we wanted to do Delft, Rotterdam, um, Eindhoven, Groningen. And no, I'm saying that wrong, but... <laughs> I'm not, I'm not much better. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, so, it sorry, guys. Me trying to get, it kills me trying to get the pronunciations right. So yeah, it was just, we kind of made it up as we went along, but we saw like a few of the, I guess, showpiece yeah. infrastructure, I guess, things <laughs> for want of a better word, like the, the Hoven ring, the bridge over the school in Utrecht. But really it was just have no plan, go where we want to, like to the cities we want to go to, and whatever we see, we see. Like maybe it's terrible, and we're riding next to trucks on busy roads. Maybe it's amazing, and well, it turns out it was amazing, right? Like, yeah. Literally everywhere we went, it was safe. It was comfortable, um, with the exception of one bad piece of traffic calming, <laughs> um, which I think I think I included on the slides here. Yeah, it was it was pretty incredible. Um, so that was the bike, um, my bike. I think my wife was looking in the hotel somewhere there um, and I was out taking pictures of my bike because I hadn't taken any yet at that point. But we, we are those. day one. <laughs> day one in Utrecht. So I guess that's interesting. So I'd seen obviously pictures of Utrecht on social media and things, but not really appreciating where anything was or where this like Vredenburg was. But, you know, we come out of the station onto this street here and it's like, oh my God, like this, this is insane. <laughs> this is the real deal. <laughs> yeah. We were staying actually just off that street by chance. Yeah, yeah. And the Bunk Hotel, which is a really nice hotel that I, I had to include photos at the start of the book. It's like an old converted church. We dump our stuff there. We go, the first thing on the corner is Starbucks and we're trying to get over jet lag. So it's like get a coffee and you're literally looking out the window of Starbucks and it's that intersection where, yeah, people are cutting across at an angle and it's just like, yeah oh my God, they just keep coming. Like they're all in shorts, t-shirt, dresses. Like it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, it really felt like we'd landed in utopia. Yeah. Um, and even in ut utopia, uh, sometimes the, the feats pod is blocked. It is like, it's not perfect. <laughs> there was, <laughs> but I think the, the real beauty of it is that it pretty much is perfect everywhere. So when like one minor blockage appears here, you just, 
kind of go around it and get you on navigate with your day. around. Yeah. Yeah. I'm being a little tongue in cheek here because yeah, it, it's not perfect, but so much of it is so comfortable that you, you just kind of, you maneuver your way around. And I have re- rarely seen anybody even like lose their temper or whatever, you know, you know, you know when they see something like this, they just maneuver around. Yeah. There was one uh, stories in the book. I think it was in Rotterdam where mm-hmm. A car driver turning across a continuous sidewalk and bike path almost took somebody out. Yeah. And, you know, in North America, you'd expect like expletives to be exchanged. Yeah. But the guy just kind of swerved around and the guy like stopped, got out of his car and like was shouting apologies down the street. And it's like, yeah, yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Like it's, <laughs> it's so different here. Even like this picture here, like it's a rural feet start, right? If that was back home in Scotland or if it was here, Cars would be doing like 80, 90, 100k along here. And here we felt, I don't know if it's the red surface treatment or just how people drive, but we felt completely safe. Yeah. Well, in, in most cases uh, with the feet strut, with this type of treatment, it's a 30 kilometer per hour street. Um, and, and literally w- the meaning of it is auto to gast, the auto is a guest. And so uh, the drivers do need to, st- to be patient, stay behind uh, any cyclists that are ahead of them, people on bikes ahead of them. Uh, and, and, and this is very analogous to what we were just talking about. The second book, when you were looking at the neighborhood bikeways, it's like our North American interpretation of this got bastardized into what we got with our neighborhood bikeways. And you can see a huge difference between this type of treatment versus what we ended up with, which were the Sharrows. Yeah. And I think, <laughs> you know, just the fact that you have a rural roadway that's 30 kilometers an hour. Like, exactly. We, yeah. we would never do that here. It's like, well, it's going to take me forever to get, you know, from, from A to B. Yeah. And I think there's a couple there. There might be a couple of photos in here of the more typical treatment that we see on the rural roadway, which is uh, the edge lane roads or the uh, quote unquote advisory lane uh, type of scenario, which is very common in the rural uh, settings. And I, I I've ridden on many of them, especially outside of Utrecht. My experience has varied on those. So in the city, I find they worked pretty well. There was one, I think it was probably 60 kilometer an hour road there. And I felt like the cars stayed in the in the central car lane rather than passing wider. Like it's like they had their lane, we had our lane. And so they passed relatively closely. So my my perspective on the advisory lanes kind of skewed a bit there. Here, I, I just, yeah, pull, like I found one example. to pull one yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and I've been on I, I've been on some scary ones there in the Netherlands myself too where the what we see here which is a very low volume street in a rural environment we can see the cattle off to the the right in the screen here and uh, again for the, the the listening only audience we're basically looking at a rural road here where the center lane how many how many meters or feet do you think that that center lane is let's say about three meters with maybe one and a half on either side for the and so the 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 center lane is actually of gray, your typical gray asphalt, and then the two outer strips or lanes are in our typical prototypical red asphalt treatment. The same as what we just saw with the feet strut with the, that red coloring. So very very consistent in terms of coloring. Of you can expect that you will see somebody on a bike in in that particular area. Uh, what's really unique about this type of treatment out in the rural settings, of course, is that that center gray lane is is really a bit narrow for two vehicles, uh, you know, to to pass each other. And there's no center line in in this type of treatment. And so it, it it's it's a fascinating type of of structure of lane structure. I think that it works best when there's low volumes of, of motor vehicles. I've been on some in the Netherlands where there have been high motor vehicle volumes. And I'm like, I want off of this as quickly as possible. Yeah, and that was the same here. The one thing I would say with this photo, and this is one of the actual the iPhone photos, just to, to nitpick at the quality here, but um, the red surface treatment. It, it, it's fine. Make right? us it's feel fine. like it was our, it did make us feel like that was our space to be in. Whereas I felt like if you were on just a rural road with no markings, you kind of feel like you're getting in the way, right? Um, and I think I took that picture as well because of the speed hump, which, again, there's a few like 60k roads that have speed humps, albeit 
quite shallow, um, but again, something we would never do on our rural roads um, in North America. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you, you made that point uh, as well. Uh, there's several uh, really cool um, treatments like this um, uh, that I've ridden on multiple times, making my way out to the airport to Schiphol. Uh, not as rural a setting, but it, you know, very, very similar in terms of the, the structure of it. And then the strategic road humps, you know, the speed humps that, you know, they yeah. would have in there. So, well, let's, let's get back to some feet spots real here real quick. And this is again, uh, the feet spot with that continuous, uh, side path and sidewalk treatment again, North America, this is what we need to be doing when we have these, you know, minor streets, uh, intersecting with a, a more major street there, there should be that continuous treatment through there. Yeah. It's, it kind of makes you wonder why you, we did it any other way, really, right? <laughs> I will plug our kind of TAC, which is Transport Association of Canada, Continuous Sidewalks and Bike Paths Emerging Practice paper. Um, so that's something I led, but we had a lot of good people working on that um, last year. So we got that published. Um, and while I'm on kind of TAC working groups, so all the recommendations in the back of Feetspad, a lot of what you're seeing here, we have another working group exploring kind of their potential in Canada as well. And looking at it in more detail than I had a chance to do in the book, like looking at the legal challenges of some, you know, some aspects of it. And I'm just going to go on record and say this. Uh, I think, you know, having um, also had Matt Pender on, uh, on the podcast a couple of different times, I'm going to just say that I think y'all, you know, north of the border here, you guys are like leading the way in terms of uh, from a North American perspective of trying to get these things sort of uh, codified into some manuals and really pushing the envelope. And I, I think down here in the States, we need to get get cracking and, and, and get moving on some of these things. Yeah. So like I worked with Matt on the continuous sidewalk one and he's on the new one as well. The, at the Active Transportation Committee, of which Matt is the chair, is is really trying to do some good things with the guidance and, you know, progress it to include a, a lot of these Dutch elements. Yeah. And speaking of a Dutch element here, this is a, a wonderful uh, unidirectional bike lane intersecting with a, a nice low speed roundabout. Uh, and, and this is this is something that I just wish we saw more of in North America, because you've got you know, a, a, a nice prioritized crossing for people walking and biking across the, the intersection, because that's one of the biggest challenges we have with the way our North American roundabouts have been, you know, created is they prioritize the through movement of motor vehicles over the safety of people walking and biking. That's not what we're looking at here. No. And of course, Netherlands have both types, I guess, like there was definitely one intersection there. I didn't take photos because I was literally trying to run across and not get killed by cars. But for the most part, like single lane roundabouts are provide priority to, to people walking and cycling. Yeah. When they have that, that appropriate space for the design, you can see in this particular uh, photo here that uh, we've got a bus navigating through the roundabout right behind uh, this modestly sized Mercedes Benz. Um, but there's plenty of space. If you notice just in front of the Mercedes Benz, there's actually plenty of real estate there for that person to actually queue up, wait, and not actually hinder that bus getting around the roundabout. Yeah. So, I mean, this, this is part of the, uh, I think the caveat of saying that, you know, this is not only, um, it, it's, it's not just motor vehicle infrastructure. This is people oriented infrastructure. It's human scaled people oriented infrastructure. Yeah, exactly. Everything it's coming back to kind of that modal hierarchy, right? And prioritizing the most vulnerable, the most efficient, the cleanest kind of non polluting. Yeah. It's safer for everybody. It's safer for the drivers. It's safer for everyone period. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Uh, you know, standard sort of Dutch uh, protected intersection here. Yeah. The, th the interesting thing there was, for example, like the Amber right turn narrow. So, you know, in North America, we have where we have vehicles turning across bikes in the same signal phase. We basically have a yield to bike sign that like a static sign that is in advance. And 
most drivers probably don't pay attention to it, right? So there's a couple of treatments in the, in the Netherlands. There's the f- kind of flashing let up sign, um, but there's also this kind of amber sign that just says, hey, you know, if you're going through, you have a green, but if you're turning right, you know, use some caution. Yeah, use caution. And 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 also to, to looking at the geometries of this too, the motor vehicle, by the time they get up to turning into that area, uh, it's, it's, it's much different. This is not a high speed, right turn, right hook type of situation. Yeah. And he's going to be kind of perpendicular to the crossing by the exactly. time he gets there. Yeah. 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 Something, I, that's what I was yeah. trying to say. I just didn't get the word out perpendicular. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Something it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. yeah. There's the other kind of flashing light up signs. It's much, much more eye catching than again, our static signs. And I don't think there's any reason we couldn't do that, um, in North America. It's just a sign. Now, here's some fun stuff. Mm-hmm. Another fun picture, because my good camera couldn't actually do this, because <laughs> it didn't have image stabilization. Um, so the phone did a pretty good job here. But yeah, the Starry Night Path, um, just on the outskirts of Eindhoven there. It's just a great example of the Dutch doing something creative with their bike paths, right? Um, now it's a short little bike path. It's a short little connection. But like we went out of our way to see that. At night, obviously, Um, I forget what time, but it would be relatively late. And we heard tons of people with different accents all around us kind of checking out the starry night path. And I'm just like, it doesn't always have to be a boring bike path. It can be something fun, something that actually draws people to the area. Um, I'd be really curious to see like the numbers, if they even have such a thing, like how many people that brought to Eindhoven, how many people the Hoven Ring brought, or maybe it's just us kind of, transportation geeks that go to see these things. I'm not sure, but we, we certainly make the pilgrimage there. Um, uh, I remember my first uh, pilgrimage to Eindhoven in 2015 was to see the Hoven ring. So yeah, yeah, for sure. So you're back in Scotland, huh? That's what I thought. That's what I felt like for sure. This was probably the first time we got really into the kind of like, the rural kind of national park area. Yeah. Um, this one's up near, near Arnhem, I think. Um, there's a really excellent lodge there. We stayed in for one night and we went back on the subsequent trip. But yeah, even, you know, through wide open moorland, you have bike paths crisscrossing it, all paved, albeit very narrow, like it's tight to pass people coming in the other direction. But just again, another amazing example that yeah. literally anywhere you want to go, you can do it by bicycle. Yeah, um, literally anywhere you want to go, you can go by bicycle. I, I, I try to emphasize that on the channel a lot is that, yeah, if you want to get from from village to village, you have options. You could literally, if you happen to own a car or you rent a car, you could drive for sure. You are more more than likely able to jump on the train and get from village to village as well. But Honestly, you probably have a safe cycle path, feet pod, just like this that you could use to, to get from village to village, city to city. Yeah, it's funny. Like the first, I don't know how many days or whatever, but, you know, we were checking our phones, Google Maps, like turn on the cycle and layer. Is there a good bike path here? And by the end of the trip, it's really just follow the signs. Like, you know, it's going to be good. You don't have, it's not like if I'm going somewhere here or, Maybe I'm in Ottawa for the first time and I've got to find a safe route somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just know it's going to be safe. And you have wayfinding signs at many of the critical junctions so that you know that if I continue down this path that we're looking at right here, which to the right of it, you've got a a little waterway, a canal there, you're going to get to this, this next, you know, city. You know, you're able to, you know, navigate very, very intuitively. You don't necessarily have to have a full battery on that phone or necessarily even a paper map. No. Um, yeah. And we, we used the node number quite a bit towards the end as well once we kind of. So to, to wrap this up, I mean, we're getting close to the hour mark and, and I'll just keep uh, as you respond to this question, I'll just keep uh, scrolling through some photos here. You went through this process in 2022, correct? The trip was 2022, and then I kind of worked on the book from basically October 22 to April 23. Okay. So having having done a similar type of a situation, I spent almost a month in, in the Netherlands in 2022 myself. And 
you know, it's, t it took me literally all of 2023 to process all the video and, and push out all the YouTube uh, videos from that. But as you were pulling together this book and now the book is published and it's out there for, for people to purchase and, and yes, folks, we will include the links uh, below so that you can, uh, uh, you know, access the book and, and pick one up for yourself. It is an absolutely beautiful book, but talk a little bit about that process of going through all of these, processing those memories, and then now that it's out in the world, uh, some of the things that are, you know, reflections that are coming up and and, and things that you're, you're sort of learning from this whole process. Yeah, it's, so I guess all I had with me was the camera and I, and I had an iPad mini. So at the kind of end of each night, you know, when my wife was getting ready for bed, I would take that time to just write down a few bullet point notes of the things that I recall from the day. And then that was basically what I was left with um, when I got home. And it was really just trying to formulate that into a bit of a narrative. The book starts off really with, here's what we did each day, like on one page. And then it kind of goes into the photos that I took that day with just little captions. It has the locations there if you want to look at it on like Google Maps or something. Yeah, the editing, I love taking the photos. The, the writing and the editing is less fun and a lot, feels a lot more like a chore. Certainly I would, I felt like I was, I would read through it. I would edit, make edits. I would read through it again. I'd probably make the reverse edits and just, <laughs> you feel like you're going back and forward. And I'd probably do that like seven times. In the end, I started using... I forget what it's called, but the function that reads it out to you. And then to hear it getting read back to you, it kind of made it easier to to appreciate what you'd, you'd actually written because I'd been in it for like five or six months. So you kind of get lost in the words, right? And you just kind of scan over them. So that was definitely a process. Then I don't know how many test prints I did. Blurb do all different types of books, soft cover, hard cover, trade paper, which kind of low cost normal book paper to photo paper. I have like one version of that book in photo paper, but it would cost you like 200 bucks <laughs> to, to purchase it. Um, so I, it's all on trade paper. It's relatively well priced, I would say, given everything I did myself, all the design, editing, writing, photographing, I forget what it even is now, 45 and 60 bucks or something. Canadian, so that's, yeah, not much in US. Yeah, and, and and to your point, I mean, yeah, it, 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 it the the camera may or may not be able to pick up uh, on this. Is that yeah, it's it's definitely it's not the typical photo paper, the glossies that you would see in in like a a, a book that yeah would probably go for like two hundred dollars at 400 pages <laughs> like this, but it's still, but you still get a, you can really appreciate how beautiful this is. If any of these images, if, if somebody wanted to get like, maybe say this image that we have, you know, on screen here, which is a rainy day. Uh, do you remember where this particular rainy day photo was at? Yeah, that one's for Edinburgh and Utrecht, that same super busy intersection. So, uh, if somebody wanted, uh, you know, to purchase, uh, you know, one of these high resolution versions of, of, of these photos, is that something they can do from your website or from your Flickr or, or just reach out to you or, or not, not for the book pictures. Um, when I first started doing the books, I debated long and hard whether just to make everything available or make it only available via the book. And at some point I felt like I had to value like my time and effort like i spent sure yeah a lot of money on that trip i spent a lot of my own personal time like yeah yeah editing the images editing the book putting it all together so i kind of felt like these photos live in the book and if you want to see those photos you get them from the book i shared a few like on social media there's there's a blog post they'll be putting up soon so yeah it's maybe worth saying so all the recommendations at the back or the findings at the back of the book I'm now pursuing through tech to try and find a way to get that into guidance. And so as part of that, obviously, all those ideas will be public, <laughs> essentially, right. Right. Um, which is fine. It's for the greater good. And, you know, whether it's me or somebody else implementing those things, you know, we need to get one thing implemented so that other people can learn from it. And, right. you know, everybody can start to do it. Um, just like Nanaimo kind of did with the continuous sidewalks. Now, there's tons of cities exploring it. Edmonton have like 30 in planning and design. Um, so keep an eye out there. 
so yeah, really, if, if you want to see the photos, look at the books. I do share some things on social media and um, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Yeah, I guess the subsequent trip to Feedspad, um, I that's where I started blogging again um, after kind of closing the old website. So I explored a lot of the things in Feedspad in more detail on that second trip. And those are all captured in the blog and those pictures are essentially part of the blog. Somebody could, in theory, you know, right click, save as kind of thing if they... Folks, if you do that, make sure you credit Roy. Don't don't be a jerk about it. In fact, even reach out and ask people if even with my my content, if you if you need to use it, um, my videos all say that you know it, it can be it can be used, it can be shared. Um, just make sure that there's attribution, proper attribution of it, and, and reach out. Let me know. I'd love to, to to know, and I'm sure Roy would love to to know too. If uh, if you're interested in doing that kind of stuff, and again, back to your 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 blogging page here, we've got the Feats Pod book is is talked about here, and uh, and and yes, you've you've got uh, you know the the link here for view Feats Pod book. Any late breaking uh, news or trips or anything for 2024? Are you going to be heading back to the Netherlands or somewhere else? I'm not sure if you got a heads up on that, but yeah, I literally booked flights last week. Um, okay. We'll be going there for another four weeks in April. Uh, ah, okay. Fantastic. So Fantastic. I have no idea of what the intent is. I just, my wife and I love it there. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll go and we'll ride around. I'm sure I'll take pictures. It might be blog posts. It might be something else. Uh, yeah, I really... Fantastic. I don't know well, at this point. I will be there... Um, in the summer because I'm going to be attending the Velo City Conference in Ghent mm-hmm. and so um, my intention is to spend you know several weeks in the Netherlands as well as uh, trying to make it around to uh, some other parts of Europe that I have not yet been able to make it to so a uh, shout yeah. out to and, and heads up to, to folks uh, there in Oslo uh, I'm going to try to make it to Norway I'm going to try to make it to Finland I'm going to try to make it to, um, also to Sweden as well uh, so so yeah, looking looking to get out there and, and checking things out. Any final thoughts that uh, we haven't yet discussed that you want to leave the audience with? Yeah, go take a look at the website. Subscribe to the newsletter. <laughs> I've got it right here, for, folks, for you. So it's rolling in the city.ca, and we will uh, have all those appropriate links in the show notes as well as in the video description below. Uh, Roy, it has been an absolute joy and pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. It's been a pleasure for me. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Roy Simons. And if you did, please, hey, give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, it'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. Uh, and if you are enjoying this content, please consider supporting my efforts. It's easy to do. Just head on over to activetowns.org and click on the support button. And by the way, Patreon supporters do get access to all this video content early and ad free. So there is that little extra bonus. Again, thank you all so much for tuning in. It means so much to me. And until Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.